What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Lost Records Journal, your Lost Records focused podcast. I am one of your hosts, Adnan. My co host, Adam, is not here. He is not here. So go into the comments and put boo Adam Evil. Put boo, boo him. Yes, big boo. Uh, no, Adam is not here. He is taking a well earned break. I've been checking up on him to make sure he is taking said break. We're taking a well earned break. But in the meantime, we have a lovely, lovely guest host alongside me. Uh, welcome to Jace. Hello. How are you? Hello. Yeah, not not doing too bad. Looking forward to uh, to get into it. Well, I'm glad that you're here because obviously, like we've met up. Obviously, we were together when we met, met, met Emma Vercelli. You also like yes. urged me to come along to that, which was quite nice as well. Um, and we had a great time there. And then we've kind of talked about lost records. We talked about lost, life is strange. And even Adam said you should really get Jason here to fill my vacancy whilst I'm away for this episode. And that is. I was like, yep, definitely. So we can kind of uh, continue the podcast on. We don't have to take a break because this has turned bi-weekly as we spoke about before. Uh, yeah. But before we start, if anything, if you are new here, as always, we do ask if you can please subscribe to the channel, turn notifications, like the video, share with your friends, help support the channel, helps keep up to date with the channel and all our content we produce. And the Lost Records Journal is available on all podcast services. So we're available on Spotify with the video version. We're available on Apple uh, Podcasts. We're available on everything. So do check us out. And thank you to the 40 people that follow us now on Spotify, which is great. And also the seven five-star ratings we have, which is amazing. Um, it's great to see. And also, again, as well, Strange Cast has already come out earlier this month as well. That's our first episode of the month, so do go and check that out. Um, and speaking of Strange Cast, this is kind of a bit of a continuation of that topic yeah. because, obviously, we've got big news, which is going to have to be the focal point of this episode and the discussion, which is that Lost Records has been delayed. Um, me and Adam talked about it in different senses. Jay's has spoken to me privately about Lost Records. You know, he said, like, he's, he's a huge Life is Strange fan. Um, interested in lost records but not obviously like in the same vibing essence like me and adam are for example we're like fully sold on it we're like jumping up and down already on it but yeah it's very much keen. yeah but it's very much keen to kind of like be like you know is keen to like look at that game and like follow it so it's kind of interesting to hear a life is strange fans perspective of that including this conversation um but before we start if anything i'll remind people who haven't been following the news if you haven't which was the news that was reported and this was that lost records um twitter page that don't know twitter page and even press releases confirmed on the 28th of June that Lost Records has been delayed. So they put today, we share the news that Lost Records Bloom Rage will now release in early 2025. We want to give both Lost Records and the upcoming Life is Strange game the space they need to shine, but we promise it will be worth the wait. So I think if anything, Jace, you start this off because I'd like to hear your perspective because obviously I've rambled a lot about it. Adam's yeah. rambled about, about it. I think it'd be interesting to hear what you think of this news and what you thought about Lost Records being delayed. So I actually think it's it's really good. They almost effectively like get strong armed in the competing with their own franchise. Like mm. are the um, the writers, I believe, that are working on uh, Lost Records are the same that were on the original Life is Strange, right? And yeah, we got to remember same, like, the same creators of Life is Strange. Yeah, yeah. So like th those two creators, like those are the writers that essentially birthed the franchise, right? Like if Life is Strange one isn't absolutely incredible, well written all the glowing reviews that you can give Life is Strange 1, like we don't get a Life is Strange franchise, and then obviously maybe they don't get a lot of lost records. So those writers almost need and deserve the respect to have their own space for a window for a game is what I'd say. Like mm -hmm. I, there's the whole like, you know, the I think the, the Barbenheimer jokes that were going on in mainstream cinema a while ago about competing them against each other. Mm -hmm. Like as a, as a fan of Life is Strange 1, I'm going to play both. As a fan of of double exposure and as a fan of Max Caulfield and the brilliant VA of Hannah Tell, I'm going to play both. But mm -hmm. I feel like just having them separate in terms of like release window just means fans effectively get to enjoy both. And I think it's um, it's going to be more important, I think, for Lost Records than it is for uh, Life is Strange double exposure. Just the weight of the franchise, I think, will just carry a lot of double exposures like PR and release time and stuff. Do you get what I mean? Like the weight of Life mm. is Strange, I think, will give double exposure naturally probably like a better release platform than, than lost records will yeah i agree and also just quickly clarify as well the the two that are working on lost records luke and michelle luke yes. was um producer on life is strange one and two michelle was um the co-director on life is strange one and two um and then they're holding those roles in in similar capacity with lost records um i think michelle's just doing the directing it's a studio direct, creative director on that game on, on itself um but i agree with what you're saying with that as well because i kind of wanted to ask you as well like obviously it's like a I, in itself like the message is quite clear where it's like we don't want to uh, compete with life you know we kind of want to give them both room it's very much acknowledgement of life is strange which i think people were surprised with 
Um, yeah. I kind of, I kind of wasn't because like at this point, like I've, as I've always said, don't know, it's a publicly listed company. It has investors. It, this is one of its two big releases in, in 2024 or was one of its two big releases in 2024. And even when I was trying to figure it out, I was, I was like kind of almost convinced that they're not going to push it back because, you know, I was like figuring out a release window. I thought maybe there was a way to do it, but in itself, it seems like they pushed it back. They acknowledge life is strange. And it seems like that was the decision because it looks like it was going to get cannibalized by life is strange in the sense that yeah. the marketing had gone very quiet and lost records. They've got a limited budget. They've not got the same massive exposure as Square Enix. They've not got the same brand appeal as life is strange, ironically, even though they created the series. Um, yeah. But I kind of wanted to ask you that with the kind of fact that it was like the good faith message that they put in there, because I think, for example, don't know how to say it in good faith, but then I've seen people instantly responding, like, it's nice to see them both like giving each other respect and like giving room and stuff. But I'm kind of like, my position is that, that basically Square Enix has hamstrung them at this point, because I don't think it's just a, I don't know, it's been like, well, you can have this space and we'll give you this room. It's kind of like, I think there's a bit more deeper to that, because for example, this was the perfect window for Lost Records in Q4 2024 yeah, because absolutely, there's, yeah. there's nothing coming out like in, in terms of major release. Like like Sony hasn't got a blockbuster game till next year. Microsoft's game lineup isn't as like necessarily like, you know, full of games there. The Grand Theft Auto comes out next year and, and it's a different yeah. genre. But I'm saying is that there's a pipeline of games next year that's so much more busy in terms yes, of schedule. Yeah. And holiday season is like the prime window where you buy games, you get them for like yeah. your friends and stuff. Like that. So I kind of just wanted to know like where you felt about when they acknowledge life, the strange message, like are you in that camp, camp where it's like, you know, they're acknowledging deck nine square and it's been like, we want to give it a bit more space, but it just, or is it actually just a goodwill message being like, you know, it is what it is. We've kind of had to move it because of this, if anything, and that's. Yeah. I, I just wonder if it's a fair that, as I said, they just didn't want to compete with the same release window and they just wanted mm -hmm. to potentially give a bit more time because i can imagine by the time they originally had the game released like it would be finished they're mm -hmm. probably just going to end up delaying it to potentially give it a bit more time to work on but most likely i i think they'll just um they'll, they'll just hold it effectively like instead of just releasing it in november they'll release it as they said in, in early 2025 like i don't think they'll be there's need to be more time on the game right like their their timing mm -hmm. window to actually finish the game Probably it probably would be ready to go. Is basically what I'm trying to say for double exposure. Like if it was, it probably will be ready to go to compete alongside it, and they're just choosing not to for for marketing purposes. And honestly, I think it is the it is the right call because it's a new franchise. Um, and you know, with Square Enix and and Don't Nod, I think Don't Nod, as I said, they've not worked on um, they've not worked on Life is Strange since Life is Strange Two, but mm -hmm. um, both the writing for those games was uh, was excellent. Yeah. Um, so I think I think fans can still be uh, very fairly hyped. I'm not as hyped for Lost Records, but I've sort of been thinking about it in like prerequisite to coming on this podcast. And honestly, like if the same team that worked on Life is Strange one and two can deliver something, it seems very themed. The characters seem very interesting. Things like the there's a wide cast. I I I, I don't know. I still trust Don't Nod to write a compelling character driven narrative. To be honest, that man. Like I am. Yeah. You know, I'll I'll absolutely um, give the game a, a play and go into it with um, with good expectations. See, that's the interesting thing where you said it as well, because like as I said, like we we spoke by off podcast when we met up, and and you were saying like you're interested in Lost Records, and it's not necessarily like it's gripping the same way of Life is Strange, which which is you know fair because it is a brand new IP. We don't know what to expect. Like even yeah. me and Adam are like doing this podcast. We've covered Don't Know Montreal for three years. They've not got that much press power in terms of like the amount of people that are going to always always cover it because it's, it's unknown territory. And you are really selling it because it, it's happened before with other studios, other developers, they've created games and they might have created a, a, a memorable game, for example, but it's not had the same, you know, success for them later down the line when they create something new. Um, but I'm kind of like just curious with, with in terms of that conversation, because like we've, we've lost records as well. I think like, this is why I'm a bit more kind of like, I think that this is a mood that kind of benefits Don't Nod because, for example, I've obviously, I'm, I've famously said that I'm on the fence with Double Exposure. I'm kind of sitting there because I think some people might have a different expectation when they play Double Exposure because, like, can Deck Nine really do what you're saying there with Don't Nod? Because obviously in that window, for like, up to, from now until, like, whenever, we have, like, mixtapes coming out, which is, like, very Life yeah. is Strange-esque game that we've seen, like, in terms of the vibes. We have Lost Records coming out, which is a obviously going to be more of a character-driven oriented piece on swan holloway who's the main character in that and then you have like double exposure coming out and and, and again you mentioned off podcast where you're like it's an, a murder mystery game and you're hoping yeah. for xyz abc to come out at the end of it where it's max's character development happens anxiety all these kind of emotions are shown 
And then I quickly yeah. corrected you saying it's a supernatural murder mystery game, not just a murder mystery game now. True. Supernatural, as they keep emphasizing it. But my kind of concern was I agree with you that, but I don't think the second half is going to be that seen there. Because like that's the thing that the Don't yeah. Not team is known for in terms of making a very creative story where like I think those kind of themes that you're saying are going to be seen in like Lost Records, for example. So like my kind of argument, and I've said it before, is that in itself as well, this could be a strategically great move because, for example, if that new Life is Strange game really underwhelms people, barring obviously Hannah Tell's return, which everyone is excited for, everyone is excited for yeah. Max's return, if the story is a letdown, then the entire focus changes onto Michelle and Luke, and it's like, well, it's your turn, guys. It's like, what can you do? And, and they are yeah. the people that were well, the architects of the series. So I was kind of curious, do you think that that's kind of like something that will be beneficial that might even turn your head a little bit more if like for example deck nine failed to deliver with this game um that square enix has kind of like commissioned if anything from them and then that kind of puts more publicity on at least lost records in terms of narrative if anything yeah i i do wonder if the, the games are going to be like a little bit connected considering obviously the the original developers for for life is strange being don't nod um i'm not sure like you know if double exposure effectively like quote unquote bombs you know there's already been um leaks that i i think uh are somewhat public but of course they're leaks so mm -hmm. who knows and, and there's still time some some of i've heard saying about like a weaker second half of the game something like yeah. that those sort of small leaks i think you guys have discussed on the pod before so particularly like if the second half of the game is is weaker and it's sort of missing and empty my only quote would be like a direct comparison would be the three chapter thing the three chapter uh life is strange before the storm um, mm -hmm. Chapter one of Before the Storm, I think, is excellently written. It's really good. Chapter two, um, you know, I've talked to you about this. I think that might be one of the best episodes in an entire Life mm -hmm. is Strange franchise, like, ever. Um, mm -hmm. Anyone that talks to me and asks me about Life is Strange, I will say Before the Storm episode mm -hmm. two is, like, S++, like, mm -hmm. a top two ep a top two episode, like, across the entire franchise. Mm -hmm. um, but then episode three is just so empty. Like, after mm -hmm. Rachel gets stabbed, for me, like, the episode is just done. Um, and it, it completely falls off. So if there's something like that, and particularly the second half of the game is weaker, then I think Lost Records will benefit because hopefully the attention shifts and people say, hey, there's still a narrative game going on. Yes, it's not Max Caulfield, but there's new characters, you know? Like, Chloe Price was just a stranger to us once. So hopefully, um, you know, Don't Nod can, can do it again. It's going to be a decade after, so mm. bit of a bit of a tall order. But yeah, effectively, that, that's my view on it. Which is quite funny as well, because like we were saying as well, like Don't Nod releasing Lost Records now near the 10-year anniversary of Life is Strange. It's just so weird when then Life is Strange is coming out at the end of Q4 2024. Instead, it's like that game just seemed perfectly fit. Obviously, Double Exposure in terms of coming out on the 10-year anniversary of it. Yeah, and like, so. and, and as you said, like there's a lot of things there which you like picked apart. Cause it's like even with Double Exposure, I'm trying to interlace this with Life is Strange because it's like, Deck Nine are working for Square Enix. Square Enix are commissioning the games. They've got the helm of the franchise. I have a very funny feeling I know where the series is going with it. And obviously, yeah. again, I'm I'm interested with it, but can you really deliver a Max story when, for example, my already my early argument is you could basically take Max out of that game and it would work? It would work. Yeah. Because like because like obviously yeah, 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 even, even the early part as well, where it's like Safi's conversation about the Arcadia based stuff, that's just that's just a section you've added in but you could still make the story work but then for example if you take lost records you can't remove swan holloway from the main story because it's going to be on her that's the character as you said like the the writing team has like focused on her as the main character she has that she's almost like the spiritual successor to max you know she's the introvertness of michelle as he's spoken about in interviews and that's the kind of character focused oriented piece that i think people are really interested with lost records i think there's already kind of like a vibe with that um but in itself as well when you spoke about before the storm there was an issue that way it's like i've always argued that with before the storm it's like it was three episodes it should have been five episodes it had more room to expand on it it needed more depth with it it rushes mm -hmm. it too fast beyond the point there's some things that i think personally speaking deck nine handle really well in there because they basically created a thing for rachel amber which never existed before that they kind of gave her a bit more opportunity and room for it the second episode's fantastic but then true colors was like a little bit of a a letdown in my own theories now where i think about it it's, it's like almost like a tech demo for me for double exposure in the sense that all the yeah. themes are very similar to the first life is strange like when you play true colors this was where my disappointment started because it's like almost beat for beat very similar to deck uh, to a don't nod game and it almost felt like a, a commission from square enix just again my theory where it's like can you make a don't nod game in the similar vein as a don't nod game and if you can 
great because we'll give you Max Caulfield for the next game and you're going to make a story on that. So it's like, that's my my thing with double exposure because I think people are going to go in there expecting it to be this unbelievable story because Max Caulfield's back. But again, can they deliver? Because it's a different yeah. Deck Nine team. It's also, again, in itself, that Deck Nine team is marred by allegations. And and are you going to really have yeah. a cohesive environment where people work together and like that is produced in the product? Like, for example, if I came on this podcast screaming at you 20 minutes beforehand and we started recording, is it yeah. you're going to see that there's something with the chemistry? It's going to be like, hang on a minute. You're not vibing off each other. You're not having the same kind of thing with it. Um, so I think, yeah. like, in itself, I think that the move from Lost Records, if anything, is, like, great for them because, like, they're basically going to move into a window where if Life is Strange does well, fair play, you know, cool, cool, cool. But then if it does bad, it's almost all the attention is going to be, like, we are the creators of Life is Strange. You know, let's run with that, if anything. So I think, like, there's so many, like, multifaceted layers so far that I've seen with, like, Lost Records and the delay and what's happened. But I think... Personally speaking, I think it's good for them, if anything, because the marketing has gone basically being cannibalized. I think the worst the worst thing possibly happened to Don't Nod this year, which was that Life is Strange comes back, but also Life is Strange comes back with Max Caulfield. Yeah. I don't think I don't think I don't That's think fair. there's any I don't think there's any worse premonition that could actually have happened in the oh actually if Chloe was in the actual thumbnail yeah. well with her. That yeah, Chloe was released as well. Yes, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. That would 100% about make it 100 times worse. And I don't know like where, where the sound of Chloe Price and what's going to happen. That I have my own theories and like, things out there. But it's like, I'm just kind of like a little bit, you know, what, what's going to happen with that? I think some people might be let down by it. But when you mentioned the leak as well, that's an interesting part because then it's like the red flags that start popping in my head where it's like, you're releasing an ultimate edition. You're releasing it two weeks early for early access. Yeah. Then it's yeah, like, yeah. are you just basically capitalizing on the early opportunity where people play it first? Is the first half great? Is a great cliffhanger? Then you get to the second part, it underwhelms. There's so many different layers there. But in itself, that has basically cannibalized Lost Records because you can't release in October because you basically, they've, they've checked off the half end of October and then also probably into early November as well. And Lost yeah. Records is be, being released in two parts as well. And they need as much time marketing, reactions, exposure that could possibly happen for it. Um, and and I think like for them, if if anything, it seems like that was the best decision, if anything. Um, so I think like in it, it's, it's it's a bit disappointing because obviously I think like the Q4 window is big. I think it's big for holidays. I think like it wasn't taken lightly the decision for Dot Nod to push everything back and like you know push yeah. Lost Records back because they did it with Banishers. They pushed it back. It's a big Q4 release, but I think like they probably realize it wouldn't hurt their sales as much, but I think you will lose the the holiday window, which is always an appeal where people buy things, they spend a bit more money, they, you know, they buy things for other people and stuff. But yeah, yeah I'm obviously it's great for me in terms of like the fact that the game's been delayed because obviously I was covering two things at the same time and I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, how am I going to get these content? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's like how much how much how much content am I going to do? But like I've I've I've, I've yeah. heard, the, the don't know Montreal developers seem in good spirits, which from what I've heard and seen. So it's like I think like they're in good position if anything, and like hopefully the message comes out clean for them after that. Um, but yeah, I think like. I think in itself, like, it's just a bit of a shame because it's going to go really quiet now, I think, again, for Don't Nod. Because I, I don't know how much marking they're going to do now between now and October, if anything. Like, they might even, like, I think the next big check marker almost, if anything, for them. And one thing I 100% expect is that the Game Awards will be a big moment for them because I imagine they'll come with a, a trailer again. Trailer, There'll be a yeah. release date. There'll be a release date for the game in early 2025 because, like, again, why would you start really heavily marketing in between August to November when basically Life is Strange is here? And it's going to, like, drown it out i imagine they'll do things i i will expect them to do things maybe even like a you know a, a character piece trailer on like swan not swan a nora cat or um, like one of those characters they might get that stuff but that'd be a good I'm one just, yeah yeah just st stagger it out just do like a small character profile like a small meet the characters before the game launches i think that'd be a good idea yeah just i think it's stagger it out i think yeah i think it's a good way to kind of approach it if anything i think it's just to kind of give it a bit more room whilst you kind of work on those kind of things um but i'm kind of curious as well like with with life is strange as well um because i i'm kind of in, infusing a lot of life is strange this episode because it's going to have to link into that as well um yeah. you're kind of like a big admirer of the comics the vicelli comics, yes as i am as well i enjoyed them even if people keep saying it's fan fiction yeah, i think there's other arguments i can make against that but you know i i like parts of what she does because i think emma's a very talented writer barring obviously very much a very talented comic book artist if anything more than anything else but i'm kind of curious because i have a i almost have this kind of misconception with some people i think that almost double exposure is going to be very much like the comics if not even more so like it because 
if you've read those comics, almost half the stuff is screaming beat for beat, obviously, like, you know, the flickers in the comics and now, like, tears, basically, in double exposure. You have this kind yeah. of idea that Max will potentially jump through different timelines. Again, had very similar beats in Life is Strange um, in, in the comic series from Emma. But then also, as well, like, I imagine other people will come back, recurring characters, etc. So I'm kind of curious, like, I, do you think that maybe people are, like, underestimating how much this is going to be very similar to the comics? Uh, I... Maybe. I mean, that's, we talked about it when we went to, to see Emma at, um, at the Traveling Man signing. Um, there does feel like a, a little bit of overlap. What I, what I liked about the comics is that the use of the, the transect was just effectively like an easy way to explore an alternate timeline. I think the word fan fiction is, it almost feels like a negative connotation. It, yeah. it effectively is. like the, I think one of the first lines in the first pages is, this is just an ending. This is just our possibility, yeah. which is like effectively what most fan fictions are when you look at Life is Strange. Like I've read a couple of genuinely excellent ones that explore Max's grief post losing Chloe, how she tries to fix the timeline, etc. Mm. And, you know, it follows um, a similar route down the comics line, but it's still like an excellent excellent piece of writing i just wonder how much they they are going to to take off those comics and rip it into mm. uh double exposure because when you get into the idea of like timelines and everything i feel like it might be really hard for players to potentially mm. gauge like what information is in what timeline the characters yeah. kind of have to be different otherwise there's no point in breaking the timeline and that's the thing they effectively got to write two stories because like mm -hmm. particularly if you believe the if you believe that the comics are are canon to to make a very long winded point here if you believe the comics are canon and one of the let's say two or three endings like the grief that Max deals with in sacrificing Arcadia Bay in the comics is like absolutely huge I don't know if you've read all of them yet but I think you've at least mm -hmm. read the first three as we said. Mm -hmm. But the, the grief that, that Max deals with and ultimately like the flickers as well. The flickers are just a sort of way of I think faster advancing the plot. Like it's ultimately grief, not the flickers, that drives Max out of that timeline and into the one with Chloe and Rachel. Mm -hmm. So the idea of grief shaking a timeline is absolutely massive and you know, it's a, a real world thing as well. Grief drives people to mm -hmm. to all sorts of emotions and it really does like create a, a quite literal like um shockwave earthquake sort of through an entire town particularly mm -hmm. if safi's a very popular and loved character so they've got to write two timelines there, she be there? right she well I, she I, I, that, she's she's kind of in terms of her relationship with the rest of the town and the people that max meets in the game and with max she kind of has to be mm. which is like my first impression with with double exposure is that do we care if safi dies and that's really yeah. like it's a really cold-blooded view of it but like we just know well, that she's max's friend but like you know, there was there was little care for for Chloe dying originally, and they've got to try and resell it all over again. And I hate to I hate to mention Chloe and Safi in the same sentence, that man, but like, oh my god, that woman is competing with the voice acting of Rihanna DeVries and Ashley Birch and the amazing written story of of Chloe Price. Chloe represents so much for Life is Strange fans. She's a trans allegory. She helped people discover their. That's a whole other a take. A lot of um, mm -hmm. trans women I know. A lot of trans women I know are very um what's the word they just see uh chloe is almost like a representation of themselves like quite subtly um mm -hmm. i'm not sure how relevant that was at the time if it's deliberate but it definitely comes across and obviously chloe's sort of like rebellious um being a gay woman as well uh being a being a member of the lgbt community she means so much to people and she also mm -hmm. means so much to max so for her to not be in this game and effectively be replaced you know, like that's the plot of Life is Strange One. Like the person gets murdered, and we care for the person. And now Safi mm -hmm. is is killed at the start of the game, and it's going to be really hard to sell if we Max will care. But I think it, it's going to be really hard to sell if tell to the player. Like, why does the player care? You know? Yeah, because I think that's the underlining argument that you've mentioned as well, which is about like when you open the comic up, it accepts that this is one ending. And it's like this is one ca canon ending. And then obviously when you go into the game, they're like, we respect both endings. And I'm like, that's impossible. Unless you're writing a 
a, a 100,000 word script or something to do that, then that's possible because you see that with David Cage, what he did with Detroit Become Human, because the branch ways are so much more bigger. And he talked about how big the script was. The game's yeah. never going to be that big. So it's like, with well, the no. problem with that as well, obviously the poignant impact immediately would have been, for example, if you respected one of the endings and then like, for example, Chloe gets shot in the trailer instead of Safi, because then you set up what, for example, happens in the first arc of Ficelli's comics, where it's like, you see Max go for that grief. She knows that what's going to happen, the eventuality is going to continue, et cetera, et cetera. So, this is the problem, which is what happens with that game. And then kind of to link it with Lost Records. Like, I think people are going to go into that game, play it. You might get really excited by it. And, and even the fan fiction sense as well. I think, like, if you're happy with what Square Enix is about to do with the series, which is take it down the Final Fantasy VII route, which, again, I will say this as well, you need to play that game because you will understand yeah. <laughs> what they're about to do with that series. It's going to be, like, it's going to be multiverse MCU-style jumping up and down in timelines and stuff, probably, because you speak to anyone who's a Final Fantasy VII fan, and like the OG ones, they seem to hate the the remakes and stuff. And I kind of get it now from the perspective of coming from Life is Strange. It's almost like it does come across as fan fictiony, if in, if anything, yeah. fan service, fan servicey, if anything, servicey, servicey, if anything. Um, yeah. But like with that, with that, with that, I think that I think that's the thing that you'll understand with it as well. I think Lost Records for me at the minute screams a very character driven, oriented piece. And it's very much in the original vein of like an original IP. It's going to be what Don't Nod were doing anyway with Life is Strange 2, for example, which was very divisive. It was like an original story, again, centric piece on this character, which is against Swan Holloway. But then, for example, with Life is Strange, now in, in, in a complete juxtaposition, it's about the murder mystery for me, example. I don't think it's about Max per se. Like in, in, in like from early perspective, if anything. Because I keep saying to people, I'm, I don't hate double exposure. I don't like, I've got nothing bad about it. I know some people are completely like, you know, off against it. But I'm sitting here religiously on the fence thinking like, my expectations are here now for you. It's no longer here or here. It's like literally up here, you need to hit the highest ceiling because you decided that you wanted to bring the flagship mascot of the series back after nine years and then hand it to a different development team. And they yeah. got the task of writing her because I don't think I ever said to you, like you you love Life is Strange, you play it. If you if I said to you, you know, here, here you go, Jace, write me a Mac story, you're gonna be like, <laughs> yeah. you know, where do you start? We we spoke we spoke to Emma about it when we were at the at the stand. She was like, mm. we're like, it's incredible what you have to do with Max because like you only have so much resource material, and then you're like a fan yeah. of the series, like an OG fan, and people like she's like such an incredible fan of that series. Like I, I will not take any kind of bad things said about her because I think she, when you meet her, she's a really lovely human being. But it's like she's a fan of the series. She had to write like all this like fiction, if anything, like that didn't even exist before for that i think that that's the problem with like double exposure because i think in itself in the context of lost records now you drown out the sound you continue with it and obviously for me it's a big blow for michelle and luke because like i could see like you know the worst possible thing could have happened there where they even reacted to it and i think they've reacted in the most dignified human humanistic way and they are those kind of people anyway as developers but i think it's just like it was just the most cutthroat thing because it was like, you know, we have a lo-fi trailer for Lost Records. We've had a game reveal trailer at the Game Awards. We had a couple of interviews here and there. And the messaging is still hard to kind of cut through with the brand awareness. And it's like, then it's like Life is Strange comes out. And it's like, it's going to completely yeah. dr dry you up here. So I think like, I'm still obviously very much excited for Lost Records. I'd wonder how the marketing changes from here and how the branding and pivoting continues from here. But I think now, if anything as well, they... Are, like for me i think they've just done this very strategically well if anything where it's like yeah, from like even from a life is strange fans perspective like if this game bombs double exposure which i think it could bomb potentially not commercially but for like fan reception point review wise yeah yeah 100%. for a fan perception review from a review perspective then that is basically like music to lost records is ear because everyone is going to be I like okay yeah because it's going to be like you know we're going to go for the spiritual successor at this point let's give it a shot it's going to maybe it'll be what i've been looking for um, and it may, some people might be won over by double exposure, but again, there's so many different things from that. Cause it's like that messaging we've talked about as well. It's like, it's a murder mystery game. And it's like, put that in juxtaposition, for example, with lost records where Swan's doing this, like, you know, yeah. um, four kid, four, four young girls or four young characters meet up. They have an unforgettable summer. However, something happens that brings them back together. Now that's something that happens during that, that brings them back together as adults that's just a triggering event, but the story is about the four characters. However, as you said, mm -hmm. take it over to that yeah. story. You have Safi, who's basically like, are, are many people really going to care about Safi? Like, obviously the big character development will happen through the story of double exposure to make yeah. her like relatable. But do many people really care? Because obviously I think like the first thing that could have happened there, it would have obviously been a repeat of the first Life of Strange. If Chloe dies there, it's immediately people can be like, 
And then you feel like you have like Phantom Ghost Chloe or something appearing in like her, her Force Awakens Jedi moment. <laughs> Je- like, Jedi Force Chloe. Oh, I, no. I, I, I that story times, I, I feel like I that story times, the, the, the Force jokes continue to just happen. But it's like, I think that's what's going to happen with it. So I think like, I, I'm kind of like weighing it up because I've had like enough time to kind of sit by it. We've kind of spoken about ourselves, like when we went for coffee and stuff. It's like, yeah. like there's so many like little multifaceted layers that can happen here. And I think in itself, They've done the smart decision by delaying this game, moving it back to next year. Obviously, I think they'll might even win more fans over. Like in itself, with you, because I'm rambling on and talking. What's what's the <laughs> thing that what what's the thing that would really swing your head that direction to Lost Records? Because again, you are interested. Yeah, um, and, and thankfully as well, because it'd be very weird to bring you on if you were interested. It's just like, well, what is this game? Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. But, but, but you're interested by it, and obviously, you know, the developers from the original game are working on it, the, from the first two Life is Strange games are working on it. But like, what would really kind of move your head that way completely? Be like, actually, I'm really keen now. I'm like, I'm really excited to kind of play this game. I, God, I, I think it, I think it's going to tie into itself, realistically. I don't think there's much that the uh, Deck Nine crew with double exposure could do that will almost it's not like it's competing in that sense mm-hmm. as i said like particularly with the release windows now being separate you know for mm-hmm. some people it is sort of a case of potentially buy one watch a playthrough of the other or just mm-hmm. watch a playthrough of one first etc now that it's separate release windows i sort of as much as i think they've sort of most likely like it's more i think it's more of a pr thing to just be like okay we're going to respect double exposure this is massive mm-hmm. and it's all it's better for them to like delay the release as well yeah. i i think what will turn my head the most for um lost records is just seeing uh trailers pop up at the right time during a uh, game award events and stuff just obviously what originally piqued my interest for for double exposure was i was just watching the game awards with with some of my friends in esports, and then I hear Hannah Tell's voice as I'm tabbed out, and I'm like, wait a minute, hang on. And then I have to tab back in, and I'm like, oh my god, like, mm-hmm. it's 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 Mike Storfield in a Life is Strange game. So if they release a good trailer, if they release them at the opportune times, which I would say maybe a couple of weeks after Double Exposure has been out, potentially won at some of the, the time game awards, I don't think there's many at the end of Q4, mm-hmm. Q1 to be fair, so they're going to have to mostly be um online i think if they uh publicized like almost a a, a reveal event kind of what um kind of like what deck nine did with double exposure mm. i think that's going to turn my head i want to know more about the characters as we said earlier i think a character trailer would be good um i just want to know a little bit more uh tidbits uh about the game because ultimately i think it took a while for the original game to really take off and and people practically mm. fell in love with it as I said, like they've got to sell it. They've got to sell it all over to us again. It's lost records. Just my, my information about the game now. I'm trying to like pull it, even though I've I've definitely seen a lot going on. Is there any essence of the supernatural? I know there's some form of, you know, not everything is as it seems, but like how how on the nose is it that there's gonna be some like supernatural elements in in lost records? Because I feel like they've they've done a good job uh stylizing and Mm-hmm. pitching their main character like as step one which is mm-hmm. it already has me interested i just mm-hmm. sort of need more to to keep turning my head like just swan if we're going to say swan is an updated uh, aka match 2.0 like they've got an empty shell to work with there again whereas double exposure because max is now in the comics and in games and people have got their own stalwart views of max like double mm-hmm. exposure doesn't have a a hollow shell in which they can they can use to it explore a whole world like double exposure should be a match game whereas lost records could be a swan holloway game it could be a i think you said one of the other characters named was nora Got yeah all my info is gone completely by nora this could, yeah this could be a nora catton game we have no idea you know like it might be through the perspective of swan holloway but life is strange one for most people is kind of a chloe game mm-hmm. so this could be a nora cotton game as well and a so- Catton game and we don't know yeah, because like, by the way, as well, if you don't know Montreal listening, I'll host your reveal event, by the way. I'm always, open. I'll do it for free as well. I'm not going to charge you Jeff Keighley prices. I'll do it for free. So you don't, you don't have to like do that. But yeah, I think, um, I think all you're saying is interesting because I think, for example, if we see Lost Records and it plays out and obviously the four characters, Nora, Cat, Swan and Autumn all effectively work as synergy, for example. And we don't know what they're going to do because obviously they've greenlit this as a franchise and a series, if anything, like we know that there are going to be more of them. And say if they bring these oh, characters wow. back, I, it, it could potentially be a story where 
you can't do a Swan Holloway game without, for example, Nora or Kat and Orton being there because they are associated quite closely with it. Because yeah, that's exactly. the problem that's that's the problem that's getting cut through with like, for example, Life is Strange at the minute, because you said that, which is very interesting, that it's a Chloe Price game, the first game. I know people, for example, who hate Chloe Price. I know people who love Chloe Price. I know people who adore it. One thing for me that is unanimous is the fact that Max Caulfield's story can't be told about Chloe Price because they are basically two peas in a pod. It's the same with Sean and Daniel. You can't make the story without them because it's the Wolf Brothers. It's built on that gimmick. And in itself, you complement the other person with it. So I think that's the big issue that we're currently having with the double exposure message and what they're trying to present with that. Because Max... Chloe might turn up in the game. She might appear in flashbacks, etc. Again, it wouldn't surprise me if Rihanna DeVries appears as Chloe Price in itself. I have big questions about that because can uh, Chloe Price from Rihanna DeVries really work with a Hannah Tell Max? People will be really upset. Ashley Birch isn't in there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You might even see like an, a, a you know a backlash where people start doing AI voice Chloe Price from Ashley Birch to replace to Rihanna DeVries. Yeah, yeah. It, it happens in this kind of thing. So you have to have those implications. And I think it's all. All quite interesting you mentioned that because it gave me a really interesting perspective because, again, me and Adam have sold on this. We've been covering Don't Know Montreal for about three years now or so on the podcast. Um, we've obviously started this podcast up with, I think, if anything as well, like, this is, and I don't like do it as a kind of like boasting, gloating kind of thing. This is where you get like marketing. This is where you get exposure because the channel just continuously talks about lost records when other people yeah. don't talk about it because... I said to Adam on Strangecast, I was like, with, with Lost Records, the most recent news that's been on Google News, if you start looking at it, was, for example, the fact that it, they delayed it. It wasn't being like covered yeah. on like a, a regular basis. People delayed, weren't picking, yeah. and people weren't picking out like quotes from Michelle's interview and like writing their own articles and stuff. It's a very kind of like hard cut front message to send from it. And I think all these will start to play into effect with it because I think this is another thing I want to give you interest because you mentioned something that, you know, you said like Swan has this kind of like really, um, you know, she kind of like has this appealing attractiveness about her as a character, if anything. But then it's also stylized in that don't nod art. And then the big backlash and the early backlash, if anything, or the kind of reception was that Max looks very different in um, Double Exposure. Obviously, it's the Deck Nine engine we're using here, the one that they've used for True Colors. It's the same art style. But even, for example, for me, the big one for me was that um, Michelle said that he didn't recognize her straight away. And Michelle, like, you know, Michelle created her. And he's like, yeah. I recognize the voice, but I didn't immediately recognize her. And then bringing Emma back in when I did my interview with her on this channel, she even said, like, you know, Max has to look in a certain way. When you look at the comic book shelf, it's like, that's Max Caulfield because you, even they've aged her a little bit, but she has like a dream catcher. She has a blue butterfly. She still looks like Max. And, and when we were at, um, Traveling Man, before we met Emma, I even joked with you because I said there's Breaks, which is Emma's book. You should buy it, by the way, as well, promoting you here, Emma. But it's like, yeah. Emma's book there. And I said to you, I joked, I said, breaks. there's the Emma. And, and I said to you, I joked with you when it was on the shelf, I said, there's the Emma Vicelli knows. And I even joked with her again about it, and she laughed. And it's like, it, it, has <laughs> yeah. this, it has an association with it. So I'm kind of curious what you think about Max Caulfield looking the way that she does. And then, for example, the art style that Don't Nod is applying here, because I think yeah. potentially that's already a beneficial thing for Lost Records compared to Life is Strange, because it's, it's retaining a sense of Don't Nod's art direction, which was in one and two Life is Strange, but then has evolved it into like engine work now where it looks quite like, you more know, mod- yeah, yeah, so more, more modernized. I think part of the the, the art style of, of Life is Strange, the original game is what sort of appeals to people. You know, the game is, is never about the looks, but I definitely you've got like modern engines, the HQs. Yeah. I think the hard thing for me is for, first of all, like I'm in the um, the double exposure camp where I think this actually really does look like Max. There's a scene they played in the reveal event that people have been clipped up and like made edits of where she's talking in the bar with Safi and Safi's like, is this about the blue haired girl you keep in your wallet? And mm. she's like, you snooped through my wallet. That to me really does look like Max, like we gotta remember, like Max is twenty eight in that story. She's mm. it's a decade on. So, you know, the woman has aged. That was a sort of at the end of her, her teenage years and now she's a she's a twenty eight year old woman, you know. I, I look at photos of me when I was, was eighteen and I'm only twenty four and I look miles, miles different. So I don't know, I feel like people have got to give it leeway. It's hard because you do look different, you do age, but you still need that noticeability about you. I think mm. people picked up on the freckles in particular. The thing for me with with um, Lost Records is is sort of more focusing on that is, like Adnan, they've got to write like four uniquely distinguished and recognizable and interactable characters. Life mm. is Strange kind of had the beauty of it. As I think Max is in the beginning of that first game and she's a little bit of a hollow shell. Everyone sort of uses Max to explore their own options effectively. Yeah. She's not really Jack a... 
yeah, she's not really a fleshed out character, but that, now we've seen her in the comics and now she's so loved, people have their own perspectives. Like they don't have that on, on Lost Records, which is great. But like going forward, if, as I said, if it's been butched as like a, a franchise effectively, there's going to be multiple versions of it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, let, let, let me put my Duma cap on for a second, because like, it feels like half the internet is wearing a negativity cap these days. Let's mm -hmm. say, oh, can you list me the names of the four Lost Records characters again, by the way? I am <laughs> so bad, not... I apologize. But don't, don't crucify him in the comments here. He's doing a great job. Of, um, <laughs> Sorry, team. For Adam. My bad. Where's Nora, Cat, Swan, and Autumn? Yeah, so like Nora, Cat, Swan, and Autumn. Let's say that everyone absolutely adores um, Swan, Nora, and Cat. But like Autumn is just the most boring, bland, unrepresentative, like not only that, there may be a little bit of a bitch as well. Like, whatever, whatever you want to put your negativity tap on, as I said. Let's say that three of the characters, uh, best case scenario as well, three of the characters are absolutely adored, and everyone is mm -hmm. just like, does Autumn need to be in this game? You know, you can pick any of the 14. You know, you get the mm -hmm. point. But does Autumn need to be in this game? Then you're going into the second one, and it's like, okay, that we're in game two, and all the fans want to hear more about potentially a relationship between Nora and Swan, if that's a theme they're exploring, between, mm -hmm. you know, um, Kat and Nora, and it's like, you know, Autumn is still there, and everyone is like, okay, I, I don't care about Autumn now, their, their character isn't interesting, etc. So I think that's a real issue with, with four characters, like the part of the sort of Vegemite Chloe Price that people love or hate effectively, is that because she's so closely linked to Max, and she's sort of a real pull for the story to write four characters that are as divisive and as memorable and as relatable and as interactable. I think it's going to be really difficult for Lost Records. Can Luke and Michelle do it? I mean, they wrote four amazing characters separately with uh, Sean and Daniel and Matt and Chloe. And I think Kate is a well-written character in the original game. I think David is actually a very well-written character. I think David gets a little bit of a tough selling before the storm. I actually don't think I've mentioned that to you. That's one of my hot takes. I think David in before the storm gets really, um, really screwed over. Cause I think it's there's a little bit Dave of a, Madsen, it's, Dave Madsen is my favorite character in the entire series. It's quite funny that like as, yeah. as outside of, outside of Rachel Amber, I think he's the best crafted character, which is a, uh, yeah, it's quite surprising. Yeah. I think he, he just exists in before the storm just to make Chloe's life more difficult. You don't really get that that air that uh black and white to him i read a, i think i read a, a fanfic actually speaking of like a, just a, a little bit to, to diverge before we get back mm -hmm. on the lost records i read a fanfic about um it was a life is strange one and i forget the name of it but in that one they really explored david's character a lot more and effectively max goes back in time and she uses the relationship that david had with a um former soldier in his um and it, like when he did his tours in, I believe it was Vietnam where he did his tours uh, canonically. Um, effectively, he loses a very, very close friend because he steps on an IED to save him out in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. um, which was, yeah, Afghanistan, not Vietnam. The time doesn't match up. But effectively, they use that PTSD. They use uh, David really never, get, uh, never getting over the loss of a friend who willingly sacrificed himself to save David. And mm -hmm. they use that to essentially justify a lot of just the very aggressive and closed off and, and just dickish behavior that we mm -hmm. see, but it feels like it's, it's not existent in those other games. So like, I don't know, that's a little bit of a, a side tangent going on about uh, how I think David can be a really controversial character, but I think mm. he can be explored really well. And it's just that level of nuance and depth that I feel like lost records are, are really going to struggle with. Cause I want them to write for amazingly mm. in depth and, um, that are just different characters, but I just feel like if one of the characters like isn't likable, dare I say it, like even if just one isn't likable, man, it's going to be really hard to continue a franchise mm. having all four of them as the center, unless one of them, you know, dies in in one of the chapters. You know, one of them does essentially get killed off. See, but then what you're saying is quite quite interesting because like in itself like obviously andrew carter who plays autumn i think he can do great as well J jace was just using his example but i think he'd be great yeah it was just one of the four it was yeah. just one of the four as i said um, pick, any, pick any of the four i think like what you're saying is right but then i also think this can be a bit different so i think like obviously swan's going to be the focal point in terms of like the projection because she meets those characters at that time like that's their first interaction when they meet in the in the summer and it's like I think obviously the main thing is to sell Swan and make her the really like relatable yes. character and then write three great supporting characters. It's almost like 
yeah. doing Max and Chloe again, where it's like your your Max is going to be Swan, and you're projecting a version of yourself onto Swan, so she might be a bit hollow a little bit. Holloway, Holloway, you know, <laughs> pun intended. But she might be a bit hollow to start with um, in terms of like as a projection volume. So you're putting yourself in her shoes. But then the other three characters might essentially become like Chloe Price, where they become like really well-crafted written characters because that's what you're trying to do. Because Max, as you said, is very different now because of the comics, because of this game, you're basically now making her like this kind of like lovable character, relatable, etc. When the first part of the original game was that she's just a projection that you project yourself on her. And then yeah. everyone can be like Max because she embodies so many different traits of her. And I think like in itself, the only thing for me with that as well, the don't not team at the minute with lost records is going to do well because they have Jean-Luc, they have Michelle, they have um, Luke in there. They have all, they've had like, you know, Juliet, they've had people from the don't not team who worked on the first two life is strange games working on it. They also have Philip Bark. Who's the, um, who was the VO director, like the legendary VO director on Life is Strange, who is working on their motion capture team with them, probably working on the VO side as well. So again, you have all the all the great pieces. You have basically had the jigsaw and you're just putting it back together essentially with like a different uh, design and shape on it, if anything. And I think that's where the benefits are going to come from them because I think like that's the problem that's going to happen with Life is Strange because, for example, with that now, you're going in with this kind of approach with double exposure and Max is a lovable, relatable character. Then you kind of sit there thinking, why the hell are you going to care about any of the other characters you're pairing in this game? Because that, that was the other problem with, for example, with True Colors because in itself, you really like Alex or something and you really like Steph, but who really cares about some of these other characters even though you're trying to sell them to them? Like some people we had, might really... We had this Ryan discussion, didn't we? Just sorry to cut you off. We had this Ryan discussion over coffee, didn't we? We were like, yeah. what is Ryan doing in this game? Like Ryan is is potentially... I don't think he's written... I don't, I don't know if he's written badly. I don't know if that was the intent. But Ryan is supposed to be, you know... If you compare it to Lost Records, actually, like you've got like Max and Chloe, but then you've got Steph. Sorry, you've got Alex, and then you've got Steph and... Um, You've got Steph and Ryan. I mean, I don't know how public uh, your theory is that originally True Colors was supposed to be a Steph Gingrich game. And they just didn't want to give up. That was my theory. Um, yeah, I don't know if you've if you've <laughs> talked about that. If, if you've not talked about it on the podcast, like, I'll give you the floor for five minutes to to go off that. Just that's important that, before we get into the, the I, topic about I'm sorry. Uh, Ryan I'm sorry. and True Characters. I'm sorry. I'm going to cut you off, Jess. That is my theory. No yeah. one can ever put their hand on it. I've said that for <laughs> three years on the on Strange House. That has been my long-standing theory on that game. Maybe not yeah. necessarily about giving Steph powers. I think other people have said that, and I kind of agree with it. But my theory is that Steph Gingrich was the main character of Life is Strange True Colors. It screams it in so many different ways. Because it's like, as you said, why is even Ryan there, for example? Like, that is basically the choice where you... you I know because they do it with the, the fact that they try and promote it as an LGBT plus Q game. Um, even though, obviously, we've heard the stuff about Square Enix and them saying that it's not a gay gay, <laughs> gay, gay game, game gay, gay franchise, but which is bizarre just, in allegations. Just fault. Just fault. Yeah, which... Which is which is absolutely bizarre, but like in itself, it's just that, wrong. that 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 game should have just been a one straight option where you basically have a love interest or you don't have a love interest, so you could be friends with Steph or you could be her, you know, romantic partner. That works well because any any playthrough I saw was always Steph and Alex. Even me, who is you know a heterosexual man, picked Steph and Alex because like that is the vibe. That's the vibe. Those are the two characters. But then Steph stand, kind of stands there sometimes in this game, and I'm like, pull her a bit forward pull her a bit forward because she needs to be literally standing next to Alex to be what Sean and Daniel and what Max and Chloe are together. But it feels like she's just a you know, little bit of an arm's distance and you only see it until the last chapter when she steps up and defends um, Alex. And then obviously, I know Ryan's dad's like, you know, Jed and etc. and he might defend him. But it's like, I'm like, I'm like, man, I'm like, you know, I could give you my flower. We could have kissed and you're defending this guy. It's like, what? So like, yeah. I think in every version of the True Colors ending as well, unless you're romantically involved in Ryan, he backs his his uh, his father over you. Um, that was that was a really disappointing uh, yeah. end for me. Um, just to, to quickly talk about the True Colors ending, um, I did a review on my own channel ages ago when it first came out, and I um, didn't like the episode uh, five five episodes I think in in True Colors going back. Um, the the whole episode with the um sort of the the RPG moment I think that was a cool but yeah, ultimately cool. looking back it didn't really do anything but I really like the I think the final like thirty minutes of True Colors I think is amazing like uh, Alex exploring a bit more of her time in in the orphanages mm -hmm. sort of bouncing around foster care and then finally like essentially getting up and speaking her truth I think it's a big again I'm going to use the word allegory because it it's what Life is Strange does so well. I think Chloe accidentally became a almost a trans representation. And I think the end of, of True Colors becomes a um, 
a, an intended allegory for women speaking out about being survivors of sexual assault. And this is a very serious case, a very serious matter, um, obviously. And I think they do that. They do that so well in terms of the ways that they they represent it because it's such a serious topic. Um, and we've talked about stuff about how um, when we went for, for for the meetup a couple of weeks ago about how some topics you said aren't being comfortable being produced in one game and how writers can often very fairly be like, okay, I don't want to talk about that, for example, etc. But it's a very very serious topic, as I said, and I I very do much believe that the ending of True Colors is a is an allegory for a woman, a survivor of sexual assault. Um, so it was really disappointing to for only basically the only guaranteed choice was in terms of her close friends was that Steph stands up for her. Like the rest of the town is older, so obviously like you've got to sort of convince them throughout the game with your own relationships. But to not have Ryan as well on your side, like basically ninety nine percent of the time. Maybe maybe I'm just wrong and people can let me know in the comments that I maybe said an interaction wrong. But from what I can gauge, I think you need like a really high romantic score for Ryan to back you up at the end of the game, which like to me is just like, man, I, I just go from not really caring about the character to just finding the character a little bit disgusting at the end, yeah. to be honest. I really which... don't like Ryan's presence in True Colors because of because of the ending and the fact that he, he doesn't back a close friend that has gone through like so much trauma at the hands of his own father. He just like refuses to believe it. I know stage one is denial, but like, man, it just leaves a, a bad sour taste in my mouth, you know, in terms of that true colors ending. Yeah, to kind of compass it back into Lost Records, and we'll wrap up here as well. But it's like, I think what you're saying there is like, for example, Ryan is like the screaming example of like char- lack of character development. Yes, that's like the point, thing. yeah. And like me and Adam has always been the person that bangs on the drum saying, I'd love to see a Deck Nine original IP, which I think many people will want to see as well, because I think the studio does have very creative developers and very creative people in there. But obviously, again, when you're working with a publisher and it's like with Square Enix, they're going to call the shots. So for example, even the story idea, I don't even think this is a Deck Nine story idea. I'm very much convinced of that because it's, it's, it's going to be the publisher calling the shots because I don't think Deck Nine even had the kind of thing of thinking like we'll bring Max back. It's going to be the publisher. Yeah, who has, that was a Square Enix call. Yeah, who has yeah. a series control direction, etc. And then, for example, the, whatever bad publicity is going to come from it, it's going to hit Deck Nine more than anyone else because it's like you're the developer. So some, some people seem to forget the publisher. But what you're saying with True Colors is like they're the problems that we spoke about throughout the entire podcast and put it back on Lost Records. Lost Records screams character development. It screams character focus pieces, it screams everything that people will want to see. I think, for example, from double exposure that I don't think they're going to see, which is the same with like Max. I think like the, the character depth, the intricacy, the lacing of like themes and stories. I think that's going to be hit better in this game. And that's why, for example, the delay will benefit them more because you eventually get to early 2025 and people will be potentially like maybe fatigued on Life is Strange, maybe want to try something different. And then this gives them the option yeah. because this could be, again be a sleeper hit. I said that I called the first Life is Strange a sleeper hit of 2015. It was. It was, yeah. And, that, yeah. and, 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 and ironically enough, 10 years from now, Lost Records could be, uh, 10 years on from the first Life is Strange, could be a, the sleeper hit of 2025 because it has every bit yeah. of potential to do that because it's currently got very little expectation on it which is kind of good as well because basically despite the fact that you are the creators of life is strange you basically have like almost this kind of like some people are keeping eyes on it some people aren't some people are interested but it could very much be a big big hit because of when it, when people play it and they're like oh i love this story it's great swan's a really interesting character you know none of these characters feel out of place it could be like as you said the theory where autumn isn't even a bad character all four of them could work in synergy they could all kind of create that max chloe sean daniel vibe which we've seen because even life is strange too the great thing with that was that sean and daniel story was great regardless of what you thought about the entire game of it they really hit home the development of the wolf brothers it was like brother, brotherly love told in such a great kind of fantastic intricacy kind of way. And you can't remove really those characters them, yeah. from the game. So that's the thing with it. Like my argument at the minute is like Max can be removed from double exposure and that game yes. will still make sense. Swan Holloway can't be removed from her game at the minute because it wouldn't make sense. Even from not knowing any of the other story details, it wouldn't make sense because you can't remove her because she is the focal point. She's our main focus. You can't put Nora in that role because Swan is the kind of the introvert, deep, character we're going to associate ourselves with and then we're going to be working with all these like variations of chloe price-esque figures like that will kind of like link into your story and make you feel a bit more developed refined almost like a coming of age story point 2.0 like we saw with life is strange um but anyway i think we've talked for a while i always try and keep this under an hour so we'll wrap yeah. up here obviously and this again this was kind of more of a continued discussion from what we have with strange cast with adam so again jace thank you so much for coming on obviously it's great to have you here and to talk about of lost course. records 
And I hope that you swing your mind completely towards Lost Records and you join us on the on the hype train going into 2025 because I think okay. you're interested. Yeah, I think I think once you, I think once you got the intrigue there, I think there'll be enough to sell you by the time we get to that point. But yeah, guys, let us know what you thought about the delays and stuff. Obviously, we heard about the straight cast, but let us know what you think about it. Do you think that potentially Max could be like you know you know Swan could be the new Max if she's bigger Max? You know, let us know what you think in the comments. It's always interesting to hear your input. But we'll leave it here. Thank you for joining us. If you are new here one more time as well, please do consider dropping a subscribe on the channel, turn on notifications, like the video, and share with your friends. Help support the channel, help keep up to date with all your Lost Records content. We are the place to be for Lost Records content at the moment, and hopefully for the long term as well. We'll bring you all of the latest here, so do stay tuned with that. And the Lost Records Journal is available on all podcast services. So we're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We're available on everything, so do go and check us out there. Give us a rating and follow them as well, so you can keep up to date with it as well. It's very much supportive for our algorithm. Jace, one more time, thank you so much for coming on. It's great to have you here i'm sure we'll mean i'm sure me and you will do other stuff down the line i think we've got other things planned at some point as well so yes, we'll definitely keep be, an eye out yeah we'll definitely be doing more stuff in here and hopefully you know adam does come back in the next episode boo him in the comments boo him as i boo said that man. Boo yeah, that pull, man. i want to see those comments put your actual thoughts but also put boo adam evil because we need to make the message quite clear to him if anything <laughs> <laughs> no brain <Yeah>. <laughs> But yeah, guys, stay tuned. Again, Lost Records Journal is now bi-weekly, so it will be back later this month with another episode, and we'll probably go more in-depth into a different discussion. I think, obviously, this was the topic to talk about on this podcast, even though it, it kind of overlapped with um, Strangecast a little bit. But yeah, stay tuned. We'll be back later this month. Take care, guys. Bye.